what a picture of um, the body of Christ at work. Um, here is God. He's uh, put his spirit on two guys and he said, you've got all the gifts and ability you need and you can teach others. And he's invited the people to bring uh, free will offerings. Those who were willing did the work. Those who were willing brought gold and jewels and silver and bits of wood and yarn and stuff. And, and there was so much of it. We can imagine the, the workshop. Right, it's crowded with all this stuff to the point where they had to stop working, go to Moses, who was in charge, and say, look, tell them to stop. We can't move uh, in our places of work. We just want to get the job done. So Moses has to tell them to cease and desist, which they do. This is the text um, I've chosen as we start our eight-week summer series on the gifts God gives his people. The gifts God gives his people. And today we're looking at artistry and creativity. Well, how about we pray? Lord, we want to thank you for that wonderful picture of um, your church, um, your people, the body of Christ at work. Um, wasn't the easiest of circumstances. I mean, they were in the wilderness and they'd just been, you know, brought out of Egypt as slaves and, um, you know, God's telling them what it means to be his people and how he wants them to behave. And then he's giving their gifts and abilities and skills to do all of that. They are very much finding their feet, but it's wonderful to hear of the willingness and uh, of the recognition that, that that work had so that the people had to be stopped uh, bringing um, stuff for them to work with. Lord, that's just a wonderful picture. And we thank you that um, as you put your spirit on Ohiliab and Bazael, so your spirit rests on us. And as we think about artistry and creativity today, Father, I pray that we'd both recognise the impact that has on us, the benefit that that has, and of ways in which you might be calling us to express our knowledge and love of you in, in, in wider and more wonderful ways. Um, so, Father, lead us and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, great to be with you uh, online and in the building this morning. Thanks for being part of our worship today. This year we'll be thinking about ways that we can reach the community around us with the good news of Jesus, and so uh, that is uh, our theme for today. And of course, it's not just about what we say, is it? It's about the way we live our lives and very much about who we are, the way that our faith has shaped us and changed the way we live, the decisions we make and so on. As someone once said, our lives should adorn the gospel. Our lives should decorate or illustrate the gospel. The world wants us to think in terms of um, sacred and secular. The world wants us to keep our beliefs um, to ourselves. But God doesn't think that way. God doesn't recognise that kind of thinking uh, for a moment. God doesn't acknowledge the thought that this is God's, but this is mine, and kind of that division or, or demarcation. You might remember the two great commandments. Worship the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I can't find a demarcation there. God calls us as whole people to know and love him. He, he loves us as whole people, and he wants all we are to be reflected in our response to him. It's not just certain parts of us or certain kinds of people uh, that he's interested in. Um, Paul says much the same thing in the New Testament in Romans 8, 29. He wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. And if you've ever made cookies or, or, or you know, uh, a cake, something that needs to be shaped, you know, you kind of squish the mush into the mould and, you know, turn it upside down and out pops, you know, an angel or a star or something if you're making shortbread for Christmas. That's the picture. Uh, all of us being um, conformed to the image, pressed into the mould, uh, which is God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the Bible is clear. How we live is a reflection of the reality of our relationship with him. And I think you could expect somebody who's more mature in their faith to show the personality of Jesus more deeply and more richly in more areas of their life. Everybody begins somewhere, but that grows and deepens and matures and ripens. And so we should be adorning the gospel with every area of our life, not just with some bits, not just with the Sunday part of us or, or just with our minds. He's redeemed us all. He wants us all to respond to him in worship, every part of us, every one. 
And as in so many other ways, the experience of Israel is a bit of a template here. So, so you might be wondering what your Old Testament is doing in your Bible. It's there to show you what it means to be the people of God and some mistakes to avoid. You probably noticed if you've read it. So through one man, Abraham, God raises up a people who become so numerous, they become a threat to the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh, who makes them all slaves so he can keep his eye on them. Right? That's their kind of situation. God frees them in the Exodus, and as they flee Egypt on Passover, they do as Moses has asked them to do. Now, you might not have ever noticed this little bit of the Exodus story, but here it is. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favourably disposed toward the people, i.e. they were keen to get rid of them, and they gave them what they asked for, and so they plundered the Egyptians. And so here's the picture. Slaves, 400 years worth of slavery, generations of slavery, released in a night. And as they leave, they ask their Egyptian taskmasters for gifts, for treasure. Gold, silver, jewellery, cloth, yarn, timber, everything. And the Egyptians are so keen to see the back of them, they say, <laughs> just go, will you? And so these slaves are taken by God into the wilderness where there's an awful lot of nothing with all this stuff. Okay, God has a plan. In a little while, God is going to give his people the opportunity to contribute these treasures to building their place of worship. He doesn't waste much. He's nothing random about God. He wanted them to make that request because he had a purpose in mind. Because you see, the really big thing about this new nation, these people, is that these are the people in whom, in the midst of which God would live. That distinguishes them apart from all others. In their midst, God would dwell. They're all living in tents. He's going to live in a tent too. It's called the tabernacle. It's just a pretty spectacular tent. And so if we're reading through Exodus, you will notice that chapters 25, 26, 27, 28, 29 and 30 all describe what this tent will look like. Their instructions, a template for making it. And then in chapter 31, which is reflected here in the verses we had read, he chooses two guys, Aholiab and Bazael, endows them with his spirit, literally inspires them, inspirits them. So they know how to work with all this stuff, the gold and the stones and the material and the timber, and they can teach others to do that. And so he sets up the kind of working group for the construction of the temple. All they need to know, he provides. All they need to work with, he asks his people to provide. And so what have we got as a picture? We've got God's people bringing God's stuff to God's artists and craftsmen, so that they can build God's house, so that God's people can worship. This great kind of circular expression of the people of God. And I'd say that's a pretty healthy picture of the people of God, a pretty healthy picture of the church, that, that they're all working together and God has inspired the lot. Their lives adorn the gospel. Right? And you could actually see, if you went into the camp, you could see this tabernacle tent thing um, and go, wow, Okay, it's a great picture or representation, yes, of the presence of God, but also of what he has um, brought forth from them or allowed them to do. It seems to me that as we come to 2022, we have a similar kind of opportunity, right? It's a fresh start, something new. We've got a plan for reaching out uh, into our community from those who don't share our background with the good news of Jesus. Craft, creativity, Music, dance, video, decoration of all kinds, including flowers. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> all express something of what it means for us to have Jesus in our lives, to be his people living and working together. And of course, the joy of knowing him. The creative arts are very much about the expression of emotion. Now I want you to think about all the ways in which the creative arts have inspired and encouraged and helped you on your journey of faith. 
have a think about all the ways in which this more creative expression of our faith has nurtured you. And we'll go for the slideshow if that's all right. Steve? So the old hymns of faith. And I do three services here a Sunday and each one of them is a blessing. We pull the organ out at nine o'clock and uh, from my high school days uh, all the way through I've been singing hymns and they become kind of you know engraved on you and there's a great resonance in me with some of the good old faithful hymns. But there also, uh, there's also more recent music. Thanks, Steve. Um, this music I call more recent. Uh, they've got Ken Morgan and uh, Robin Mark. Um, again, uh, in my journey of faith, a great source of encouragement to me. Love those tunes. Uh, know them all by heart. At Christmas time in our house, uh, we play Handel's Messiah. Now, I don't know if you've ever been exposed to Handel's Messiah. It is the most extravagant piece of music uh, created in one sitting, as it were. I think the one sitting took 21 days. Um, Handel locked himself in his upper room. He didn't eat, apparently. They kept on bringing him food. He kept on refusing it. Um, a wonderful story of creativity and uh, such a wonderful expression of faith. I, I commend it to you. And, of course, we have our own musicians. And you might have seen uh, our string group play at the Block Arcade there. And that's a very uplifting experience. And certainly, uh, as you come to worship on Sunday, um, and here's a picture of 5 p.m., a uh, more creative style, a uh, more contemporary style uh, of worship. And it, it all speaks to my heart. So I don't know about you, but I really resonate with music. I enjoy singing this morning. It encourages me. I, I remember the words. I, I hum the tunes. It, it, it brings me closer to God. Wonderful way the creative arts encourage me. Likewise, also art. Uh, I appreciate art. Uh, that uh, marvellous work uh, by Da Vinci, and uh, the next one is by someone called uh, Cararaggio, or sorry, can't pronounce that very well, um, Thomas making his inquiry of the risen Lord Jesus. Uh, I can stand in front of those things for a long time, and, and it, they bring the biblical story to life for me. We have our own Abby Gilbert. Uh, there it is there. Uh, if you didn't see the kids talk about Boaz, there's the artwork that she created while she was telling the story. It's a fabulous thing uh, indeed. We have our own stained glass. If you've not been to the parents' room recently, uh, you might appreciate the breaking of bread on the road to Emmaus, that wonderful text. Uh, he was revealed to them in the breaking of the bread. Again, you know, that... That's really, it brings to life something that we kind of hear. Um, but for, for, as it's my privilege to celebrate communion week by week, I think about that. You know, he's, he becomes known to us in the breaking of the bread. He's present with us in the breaking of the bread. So artwork or, or, or film. Uh, I don't know if you're a film buff. Um, Mel Gibson's The Passion made a deep impression on me. And more recently, uh, the um, YouTube series uh, The Chosen. It's really worth a look. Again, it takes something that with which we're so familiar and brings it to life in a new way. It speaks um, fresh. I like Christian biographies. Uh, I don't know if you know that Sidney Meyer from the department store, uh, a Jewish man, became a Christian. His story is a very inspiring story. There are so many uh, stories of Christian biography, great, you know, the great ones, uh, or ordinary people who God has used in great ways to encourage and inspire. And I don't know about you, but that keeps me ticking along in my faith. I believe it could also be true for me, you know, if he's been able to do it in the lives of others. I enjoy reading and my allegories, uh, Narnia and the Lord of the Rings are great, written by great Christian authors and uh, great um, um, structures or frameworks in which the Christian faith can be understood. Um, another one which pr probably none of you have ever heard of, Hind's Feet in High Places, a marvellous a marvelous allegory uh, about um, pain and suffering actually in the way God uses that to reform a life. Um, very helpful indeed. And then, of course, there's the kind of hard stuff, the ceramics, and you might have seen Headley's artwork uh, on display at Easter time. Uh, he entitled it um, Empty Space, Huge Impact. And, and again, it, it, it kind of communicates uh, the faith in a, in, a, in a different way. Good on you, Headley, for your creativity if you're out there. Uh, bless you. Um, I suppose another kind of 
creativity is cake, right? And I just think our Christmas cake every year for the happy birthday Jesus service just blows me away. There it is in the fridge this year. <laughs> Before we ate it, it was yummy. And um, every Easter, um, some lunatic gets up in an aeroplane and paints that in the sky over all the capital cities in Australia. Isn't that fabulous? So encouraging to stand in the Bentley and point up to the sky. And there's an opportunity to bear witness to your faith. Thanks, Steve. That was great. So like the tabernacle, right, that's where I'm going, like the tabernacle, the glory and magnificence of these things are not a tribute to their makers, but to the glory of God. And if they point you to him, then they've done their work. God gave Bazael and Ahiliab the skills and abilities they needed. As I said, he literally inspired them, filled them with his spirit to use their skill to bring him glory as he had given some of his, and he's given some of that same spirit to us here in the church at Ormond. Now, look around the place. It's a pretty sparse display. There's a few banners up there, but, but that, that's, they're there from a long time ago. And if you were to uh, wonder about the life of this church, just by looking at the buildings, I wonder what, what, what you would conclude. I personally love visiting people in their homes. And I love checking out the pictures on the walls and the artifacts on the mantelpiece and the, you know, the notes on the fridge because it tells you something about the home you're in and the people who live there in a way that perhaps you could never find out otherwise. Now I'm wondering whether some of the creativity that God has endowed us with here at Ormond might be used in that way to communicate not just who we are, and there's some photographs I know <laughs> that give a little bit of a window into who we are, but, but about our faith and about you know, our joy uh, because of the God we worship. There's so much creativity here, and I don't think we see enough of it. This is God's house, and I would like to see it adorned with the creativeness of his people. So here's just a small sample of uh, some of what a few of the people here at Ormond are up to. So we've got um, Kate present in the congregation this morning and she's prepared a little slideshow. Could you continue that one? Here we are. Creativity by Kate Clark. Just keep flipping through and I'll read it if you don't mind. So this is all Kate's work and she's packaged it up for us so we can see it easily. It's in the food that we eat so you can be creative in the way you prepare and present your food. Thanks, Steve. It's in sculpture. Now we've got, is it Lalani? Is that the right way? Close, not bad for a Kevin. Um, I can't work out whether Lalani is a tree or a person or a butterfly. There's an awful lot going on here. So there's a little picture of her, but you can come and just, just it's, I went to the Clark's house the other day and I thought, I thought, what's that? <laughs> and the more I looked, the more intrigued I became. It's just a marvellous work. So it's there for you. Uh, I'm inspired and encouraged. I mean, I'm, to think for anybody to do that just blows me away. So what else could there be? Thanks, Steve. It's the way we look at the world, creativity, the, just the way, we, the, the way we see things, the shapes and the colours. It's in painting. Some great stuff there. Or drawing. Even the way we style our hair and wear our clothes. Very creative. It's all around us. It fuels us and itself in the form of inspiration. And the best part is anyone can do it. If it's in you, let it out. So good. Bianca, uh, who comes to five, um, has now got work in costume design. So here's some of the shows uh, that she has designed and produced costumes for. We'll just flip through these ones, Steve. You might have, I think I saw that one on ABC TV, SBS, I mean, yeah. So this is very creative stuff. Yep, great. This is work by Abby who did Boaz for us. It's, that is a lino print of what she sees out her window from the kitchen. And there's another one. Licorice all sorts. Again, a lino print. Oh man, you've got to realise, of course, the guy preaching, you know, uh, for whom art is a stick figure. <laughs> it's progressed much. Uh, <laughs> Friends, 
art, creativity, is a reminder that we are in the presence of something bigger than ourselves. It's a reminder that we're in the presence of something bigger than ourselves. And I've got a cathedral there, Steve, to show. Uh, and if you've ever been in a huge space, particularly a space used for worship like that, um, you'll know something of what I mean. Even the next one, uh, a Banksy uh, spread on a wall somewhere. And, you know, the surprising nature of some of the graffiti that we see, some of the art we see, you go, oh, and it stops you in your tracks. And it's drawing you out, huh? It's bringing you into a space larger than the one you normally inhabit. Thanks, Steve. So today, I'm asking this question. How does our corporate life as a community adorn the gospel? And what is your part in that? And how is that seen? What expression does that take? Are we really good at music? We're really good at music and we take our music out and we invite people in to be part of our music. And we're really good at, you know, the cerebral stuff, the Bible studies and the word-based things. We're really good at that and we love our hospitality. You know, see the Christmas Eve picnic and just the way we love people up. We're really good at hospitality in general, you know, come in for playtime and we'll love on you and so on. But of course that, you know, and there are other things, but that's narrow, isn't it? compared to the whole expression. Certainly we see in the community, but certainly that God has even given the people who are here. It's not like we have to look outside and find someone who's creative. <laughs> we have them. What are we doing with what we've been given? We're wanting to invite people who do not share our background into our place of worship this year. What does the place of worship say about us at the moment? What would they pick up by coming through the building? What story perhaps could we tell if we used some of those creative gifts and abilities we've been given a little bit more intentionally? Yes, there are a couple of canvas photographs on your way to the toilets and you can look into those and see something about who we are and what we do as a church. But again, the window is a fairly narrow one. So what do you think our buildings say about us? What would you like our buildings to say about us? And what could we do about that? And what would your part in that be? Do you have a talent or a passion? Is there something that God uses to inspire you and encourage you in your faith? You know, music, art, film, whatever it is. Why don't you bring that here? Why don't we use that as part of our family life here at Ormond? The Lord, if the Lord has given you ability to worship him by creating something of beauty to the glory of God, why not do that? I talked to Mike Rater this week about coming to encourage our emerging preachers and uh, I asked him, you know, what is it about preaching that works for you? And he says, oh, you know, I look at the text and I go, what am I supposed to do with that? He said, by the end, I'm so excited to preach it because it has become a thing of truth and a beauty. So much of what we have been given, if we were to release it, would paint a picture, tell a story, engage hearts with truth and beauty. What creative thing does, has God given you to share? What, what creative thing encourages you in your faith? We should be doing that. We are his people after all.